Welcome to another Dr. Sadler's Honest Review. This is a book review series in which I look at generally recent, although I'll go back sometimes into the catalog, recent works that have to do with practical philosophy in a very broad sense. So it includes philosophy proper, whether it be ancient or contemporary or anything in between, philosophy as a way of life, uh, ethics, those sorts of matters, all the way over into fields like organizational psychology, personal development and self-help, uh, leadership studies, and anything in between. So the book that I have for us today is Heidi Grant's Reinforcement Subtitled How to Get People to Help You, which came out with uh, Harvard Business Review Press in 2018, so a fairly recent one. And as usual, I'm going to talk about the three S's, style, substance, structure, and summary, um, talk about some of the key ideas, there's a bit of overlap there, tell you what I think is good about the book, and, you know, things that I think are a bit problematic. There are some in this one. I give it a rather mixed but overall positive review. So, and then I'll, I'll have a few final thoughts. So that's what we've got in, in this having to do with reinforcements. The style of this book is at the same time rather easy breezy, but also very carefully crafted if you know how these kinds of books are designed and how the editorial and authorial process works. It, you can see a lot of tells in, in this book. Um, a lot of short little sections within the chapters, lots and lots of personal narrative, some of which may be, you know, entirely on point. Um, we don't really know. And there's also lots and lots of very boiled down references to classical and contemporary psychological studies. And that's a, that's a topic that we're going to get into. It's very readable. It's designed to be very readable. I think you can quite easily tell that. Um, there are a few notes, but they're all at the very end. And there's not an awful lot of them uh, with, within this. I mean, each chapter has, oh, about anywhere from, well, the, the, the top one would be 16 uh, end notes. Um, most of them don't have quite so much, but it does give you the references. It's got, got a decent index. It, it's sort of what you'd expect to come out from Harvard Business Review Press. And as they say in the book jacket, right, um, it's supposed to be a pragmatic book. And that tells you a little bit about the summary and the style. It's not supposed to be a scholarly or academic, um, or even really very rigorous kind of book, although it does give a lot of, I would say, in my view, rather helpful advice uh, for the, the reader. Um, there's lots and lots of anecdotes, uh, which I don't think is a, a real problem. There's little reminders at the end of every single chapter, uh, usually three or four bullet points under a section. It helps to remember, to help you, you know, recall the things that she's talked about in the last, you know, 10 pages or so. Um, and those, I think, can be decent summaries of, of what's going on within the chapter. Um, on you know, early on in the book, she tells you that the book is divided into three main parts, each of which aligns with a particular function, a purpose for, for writing the book. So she says, part one is a deep dive into why we generally hate asking for help. Okay, something that's quite needed, right? Because many of us don't actually understand why we don't like asking other people for help when we could you know very well deserve it or need it or it could be quite useful for us in part two she says i explain the right ways to ask for help laying out techniques you can use to not only increase the odds people will want to help you but i'll allow them to feel genuinely good about doing so and that's an important distinction it's not just about success this is actually i think jumping ahead one of the good points about the work there is a kind of 
respect for relationships. It's not just a, you know, how to influence people kind of, kind of book. Um, the part three, she says, we'll dive into why reinforcements, the people need rein, uh, yeah, reinforcements, the people need reinforcements, the motivators. So she's using reinforcement in two different ways. You'll see how creating a sense of us um, helps provide an essential form of reinforcement for high quality helping. And so, you know, quite, quite good, I think. Um, we can basically look at the chapter titles to get a sense of what the key ideas are, but it also gives us an idea of the structure and the summary. So I'm just going to run through them very quickly, and then we'll look at them a little bit more closely when, in the next section. So part one has three chapters. Uh, chapter one, it makes us feel bad, help asking people for help. Uh, part uh, chapter two, we assume others will say no. And then chapter three, we assume asking for help makes us less likable. Part two, how to ask anyway. So there's three chapters in that one as well. The inherent paradox in asking for help, the four steps in getting the help you need. And then actually one of my favorite chapters, don't make it weird. Well, that's a great title, right? And then part three, uh, creating a culture of helpfulness. The in-group reinforcement uh, is chapter seven, the positive identity reinforcement, chapter eight, and uh, chapter nine, the effectiveness reinforcement. So you notice she's invoking this sense of reinforcement in the, the chapter titles by that point, because you've gotten used to thinking in those, those terms. And then, you know, there's um, a few other bits and pieces, um, but that's really the, the core of this text. What are some of the key ideas that you're going to find in this book? And when we talk about key ideas, we should also talk about practices as well. These are actionable ideas. So in, in chapter one already, which is where the book begins, there's really not a, a introduction or foreword or anything like that in any sense. Um, she talks about there being an inherent paradox, and this is going to get explored more in a later chapter, but the formulation here is really quite good. While help freely and enthusiastically given makes the helper feel good, researchers have found that the emotional benefits of providing help to others disappear when people feel controlled, when they're instructed to help, when they believe they should help, or when they feel they simply have no choice but to help. In other words, a sense of personal agency that you're helping because you want to is essential for reaping the psychological benefits of giving support. Now, is this really a, a paradox or is she, you know, chosen perhaps the wrong term for it? I, it's, that's debatable. I don't, I'm not going to worry too much about that at this point. I will say this, that um, this is really a, a central key idea for the, the book that you don't want people to feel just compelled, whether it be out of a sense of duty or you putting pressure on them or some other thing that's going on, uh, if you want to get them to help and to feel good about helping. And you might say, well, who cares if they feel good about helping? And there's, there's answers to that that could be provided. Well, if you want them to be reliable and continue helping, that's important. If you care what other people think, then uh, presumably that matters to you as well. I think that applies to most of us. Then uh, a little bit later in the same chapter, there's a little clarification about reinforcements. Why is the book called Reinforcements? Because there's two senses of the word reinforcement, and she goes to Google to find out what these two more specific sub-definitions are. Uh, you know, did she really need to go to Google. I think this is the sort of like being relatable to people. Uh, but the two ideas are this extra personnel sent to increase the strength of an army or similar force, the process of encouraging or establishing a belief or pattern of behavior, especially by encouragement or reward. So we've got like the personnel side of uh, reinforcement, you know, getting people on your side. And then we have the, let's, let's strengthen this motive. Let's strengthen this behavior. Let's ensure that people are going to do this. And, um, she says that the idea of extra personnel is, is really the basic need I designed this book to address. 
when we want people to help us, we are trying to get additional people involved in whatever it is that we're, we're doing, right? And then the second notion, um, she brings up B.F. Skinner, uh, who famously called the use of reinforcements to make particular behaviors more likely, operant conditioning. And she says, you know, people don't actually work the way, exactly the same way as the rats and pigeons Skinner studied in his laboratory, but the general principle is spot on. So this tells you where she's coming from, right? Um, the book relies a lot on... Um, references to and interpretations of experimental or organizational psychology studies. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, you can get a, a solid idea about what she's talking about in each of these chapters by looking at the title. So in It Makes Us Feel Bad, she, you know, that's, it's essentially her introduction. And then she jumps into why your brain doesn't like to ask people for help, and she frames it in terms of all of these, these threats, and that's the end of that chapter. Chapter two, we assume others will say no. Why do we actually make those assumptions? You know, what do the, the studies have to tell us about this? She goes into, you know, how motivation is structured by uh, expectation of success and the value of succeeding. Um, you know, she talks about underestimating helpfulness of people who said no. That's one of the um, uh, chapters. And then she's got some interesting stuff about cognitive dissonance here as well. Um, chapter three, we assume asking for help makes us less likable. So what is she doing there? She's trying to examine a very common misconception, really. Uh, we often don't have good reason to think that asking for help is going to make us less likable. She's got a funny story here about Benjamin Franklin and, and borrowing a book. Um, and she says we underestimate how good giving people, uh, how good giving makes people feel when they get to, to give, they feel better or less bad. Um, and more helping can lead to greater life satisfaction. Of course, this is, you know, relying on a lot of uh, psychological studies. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. And so that's, that's the beginning uh, section. And then she starts getting into the nuts and bolts. How do you actually start getting people to help you? And in Chapter 4, she goes back to this inherent paradox, as she calls it. And she talks about four possible responses. And then um, the difference between having to help and wanting to help, which, you know, could actually go along together, uh, and how we can sometimes inadvertently make people feel compelled to help. We can, you know, draw on what we think is going to be helpful for us in getting them to help, but it, it turns out to be less so. Chapter 5 is very uh, nuts and bolts as well, the four steps to getting the help you need. So this is going through these, and each of these steps is a little bit uh, more complicated than, you know, just a, a bullet point list, right? Uh, there's, there, you can talk about them as factors, um, the things that you need to attend to in order to get people feeling okay about about helping you, wanting to actually help. And she talks about obstacles here that you need to overcome. And I, I think a lot of this is, is pretty on point. Um, so that's a really helpful one. I, I mentioned that I really like chapter six, Don't Make It Weird, probably my favorite part of the book. And, you know, she talks about a lot of ways in which people do, in fact, make requesting help from others weird in different ways and how that's likely to um, push people away. Just one example here that I, you know, I think a lot of people can relate to, apologizing profusely. You know, you don't need to make it all about you and your apology if you want somebody else to help you. And I'll just bring in an example here. I often have students who are behind on their work and they, you know, talk about how awful they feel and, you know, they're letting me down and all that. And I'm, I'm like, listen, uh, just try to get the work done on time. This is why I have a late policy. They're, they're in effect asking me for clemency or help in, in a certain way. And it does make it weird, right? Um, so this is, you know, I find this is actually kind of, kind of cool. Um, Oh, here's another another great one. Uh, emphasizing how much the other person will love 
helping. Yeah, that's that, you know, sometimes you don't want to love helping. You just want to help the other person to, to get something done. So that, this is a great chapter. And she also talks about like how, how to avoid making it weird. Uh, or if, you, if, it, if it is weird, how to de-emphasize that. Then, you know, part three is called creating a culture of helpfulness. And it's interesting because you're not really creating a culture unless you are a person who's at a very high level. This is Harvard Business Review, so you know it, it's basically aimed at uh, not just the general public, but would-be leadership types and their emulators. Um, but a lot of this is less creating a culture and more playing off of already existing culture. And I mean, it can be about relationships, but I think, you know, culture and relationships are kind of bigger. So, you know, there's like how to create the sense of being in an in-group. That's what Chapter 7 is really about. Uh, and that is a reinforcement, the in-group reinforcement, right? So you're, and it's the double sense of you're getting people to like come in because they feel like you share an in-group. You're also like appealing to the in-group so that they will then do what you want them to do. Uh, the next one, the next reinforcement in Chapter 8 is the positive identity reinforcement. And this has to do less with knowing yourself um, and more with getting, getting other people to understand you, but also to understand their self in some sort of connection with you. I mean, there's a great section here, what helping you says about me, right? But this is actually something that you would turn towards the other and what helping you says, or what helping me says about you, right? And so, um, you know, this is again, trying to get people to, to do what it is that you want. Um, there's a great point here. The helper's identity matters, not yours. That's, that's quite true. That could actually fit into the making it weird. And then there's this effectiveness reinforcement discussion where it, it, there's a lot of stuff being framed in terms of really big picture stuff, bringing in Sigmund Freud, uh, talking about the meaning of life and, um, talking about impact on, on things, seeing your help, uh, land means more, more helping, um, and, and how, how we can, you know, in, this is a great thing, how you can increase your helper's sense of effectiveness. It's not entirely about increasing their effectiveness. How can you create the sense, the impression that they're, they're being effective? Um, and then that's, that's where the book ends. Um, there isn't any sort of like, let's wrap it all up here. Here's all the different things come together. It's just, you know, gone through sequentially. So that is, that's the key ideas of this book. All right. So what is good about this, this book? I think there's quite a few things that I do like about it. There's a lot of useful advice and concepts and reminders that are actionable. And I think a person could take this book and read it in light of other things in, in terms of their experience and, and, and get some use out of it. Um, I mean, a lot of what's, what's being said is said elsewhere. It's not breaking radical new ground, but I think, you know, we can say that about many things. This could be quite useful or helpful if you prefer, um, you know, for somebody who hasn't thought about these things to, to read or, you know, somebody who has thought about them and needs some reminders about these matters. It could be helpful in that way. Um, there, there are some really good emphases on the connection between helping, as I mentioned before, and agency and autonomy. I don't, I don't think it's really a paradox as such, but it is something that has to be thought through and attended to. So, I mean, it could be a paradox in an attenuated sense. It's not a paradox in any, any real sense. This isn't confusing to, to uh, people who understand these matters, but it is really great to emphasize that if you want people to not just help, but to 
have the sort of right motivational structure for helping and continuing to help and maybe talking about their helping, you do need them to buy in. And how do you get them to buy in? Well, there's, there's a lot of stuff about that in here. Um, I think there's a lot of good little sum ups in here uh, about how things work. Um, I'm going to just, you know, talk about ways to make it weird. I mentioned this is a, a favorite chapter of mine. So what are the different ways to make it weird? Overdoing it on empathy. Empathy can be a, a powerful motivator, but when you're appealing to it too much, um, that can be a problem. Like she says, use empathy as a help-seeking tool with caution or it might achieve the opposite result. Apologizing profusely. We just talked about that. Using disclaimers. Those seeking help are so busy trying to establish they're not personally weak or greedy. They turn the focus away from the helper and onto themselves. And so that, that's a problem. Emphasizing how much the other person will, will love helping. Uh, portraying the help you need is a tiny insignificant factor. That's a way of, you know, that, that, that kind of misleads people, right? Reminding people that they owe you one, that definitely can make it weird. Although, you know, it depends on what culture you're in. A lot of these things are, in fact, culturally bound. Um, talking about how much their help will benefit you, right? Um, that can also turn people off. Um, so, you know, that's a good listing. That's a good way to work through things. Um, the four steps that I mentioned before uh, to getting you the help you need. Um, a little bit earlier in the work, um, in the inherent paradox, the four possible responses to a request for help. I, I kind of like seeing this analytic stuff. What are the four possible responses? No silence, grudging yes, enthusiastic yes. There's a little description of each of these. Could there be more? Yes, but these are most of the gamut of what is going to happen. So I think those are, those are some good things. Um, the, the style, you know, I mentioned that it's, it's in some respects kind of artificially genuine, you know, artificially folksy or breezy or something like that. But I think for a lot of readers, um, you know, it's going to work. They're going to like it. You can you can read this book fairly quickly, and uh, you're not going to be caught up by an awful lot of jargon getting in your way or anything like that. So those are all good points about the work. Um, I think you could take this and run with it, and it could it could in fact benefit you in um, getting people to be more helpful for you within your life. I did find some things a bit problematic about the work. It's interesting that it draws so incredibly heavily on um, psychological studies and has z almost no engagement with the vast literature on giving, on reciprocity, on benefits, on helpfulness in ancient philosophy, all the way into the modern times. The, I mean, the one example that would be uh, different from this would be the discussion of Benjamin Franklin, um, but it, it's disconnected from any, anything else in Franklin's work. Franklin actually was a, a philosopher. So there's a lot of reinventing of the wheel of things that we might find, for example, in Seneca's On Benefits, right? Or in, in some other works. Um, and I think that the reliance on the psychological studies and theories is rather fast and loose in, in a way that makes me myself distrust um, some of the theorizing that's going on and some of the blanket statements and generalizing that's happening in the work, um, it's it's almost as if there's sort of an unnamed fallacy that is sort of like a, a fallacious appeal to authority, where you reference a well-known study that everybody knows proves this. Although if you look at the study carefully, it doesn't prove anything remotely like that, right? And there's a lot of ad hoc uh, stuff and assumptions built into it in order to get the generalization that you're looking for. Um, so I, you know. I find that 
quite problematic myself. The average reader perhaps might go along with her and be cool with that, but I think that itself is a bit of a problem. I'll just give you one example of this sort of thing. So she's talking about reciprocity, which is um, something that is, is, you know, been talked about for millennia, and she tells us there are actually three flavors of reciprocity, according to research by Frank Flynn. And to her credit, you know, there's a, 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 a end note to that. And what are the three kinds of reciprocity? Personal reciprocity, a kind of negotiated exchange or barter. Relational reciprocity, the kind of reciprocity we engage in in our actual relationships. I mean, that's circular definition, right? And then collective reciprocity, a kind of generalized exchange of helping at the level of a group. Now, does that cover the gamut of reciprocity in the literature? No. Um, and, and, you know, she's going to use that. Um, and to, to be sure, a lot of the practical advice that's contained in this work that seems like good advice could be stripped away from the justifications that she's providing. It's almost like the, the justifications are window dressing to provide a sense of authority to get people to be like, oh, well, psychologists have said this works, so I'll trust this, right? It's almost like a placebo effect in, in many respects. As a, you know, as a researcher, a philosopher, I find that kind of approach, as I said, problematic because it seems playing pretty fast and loose with, with truth in, in a general sense. Um, but, you know, maybe you could put that to the side. There, there are a few places where you're like, I don't know that this is actually right. Um, towards the end, she actually like gets Freud really wrong. You know, she says founding father of psychology and cigar enthusiast. There's like the breezy, you know, uh, attitude. Sigmund Freud would give an answer, give an answer to what, um, what, you know, what do people need to be happy? What does happiness look like? He would give an answer which formed the implicit basis for how psychologists approach motivation for a century. Big sweeping statement there too, right? Along the same lines, he said, human beings wanted to approach pleasure and avoid pain, period, full stop. If something feels good or get, gets us a feel-good reward, we do it. If it hurts, we don't. Now, did Freud say that? No, Freud, Freud's views about, you know, uh, pleasure and pain are way, way more complex than that. So what is she doing you know, as a person who's supposed to know the field of psychology, bashing Freud, uh, using him as a springboard to, to launch into her own project, basically lying about what Freud actually said to the reader. Ooh, that's, you know, in my, in my view, that, that lowers credibility. And it tells me this person is, what are they, what are they doing? I mean, in terms of like helping, this is not helping her case. Um, so, you know, did stuff have to be arranged like that? I, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, maybe she actually does believe that, in which case she's wrong about somebody who's a major, you know, early theorist in her, her field, or she's saying stuff to try to pander to the reader. Either way, it's, it's, it's a problem. So, you know, I, I don't think that that has to damn the book as such, but these are things that one should call out. So my final thoughts, um, it's not a bad book, and that's about as far as I can go. It's not a great book, definitely not. It could be a good book, depending on how you use it. You should probably, if you're reading this, just ignore her opining and reductionist stuff about Freud, and, and probably put aside a lot of the stuff, or take it with a grain of salt when she says, psychology tells us X, Y, Z, and just focus on the actual pragmatic advice that she's giving you in here. And then it can be a, a good book for you, but it's not a good book overall. Um, so I give it a sort of, you know, if, if you want to get ideas about how to get people to help you in a very practical way, I would check the book out. 
Um, I, I don't know that I would buy it. I think I would probably get it from a library rather than purchasing it. But, you know, people like to buy books and, um, you know, can't hurt to, to have it and maybe pass it on to friends. This actually could be a decent book for um, purchasing for somebody who has a hard time asking other people for help. And maybe it, it could circulate. Maybe this could actually be an article of help within a giving exchange, a type of reciprocity right there. So a qualified endorsement of the book on my part.